Hi, today we're going to talk about domain and range, types of functions, transformations, composite functions, and even and odd functions. Remember to take notes as we go and write your questions so that we can address them tomorrow in class. First of all, we'll talk about domain and range. Domain is the possible x values that can go into a function. Usually the possible x values are all real numbers. The symbol for all real numbers is usually two bars, at, so that's real numbers, so that's symbol for all real numbers. There are exceptions. A denominator can never equal zero, so the function could have a domain of all real numbers except x cannot equal whatever. And then no negatives under a square root. So those would look like x is greater than or equal to 7 or whatever values you can have under a square root that make positives. Range is the resulting y values. The easiest way to think about range is the x values you plug in and then do whatever function, it, whatever function you have, like multiply it by 7 or add 2 to it and think about the resulting answers you would get. It also helps to look at the graph to see what the maximum high and low values are. So since the range is y values, you might have all y values greater than or equal to 5, or you might have y values in between two values, like between negative 1 and positive 1, or again, y values could be all reals. Let's look at a couple examples. Find the domain and range of y equals the square root of x minus 5. Now the restriction is that x minus 5 has to be greater than or equal to 0. It could be equal to 0. So x minus 5 is greater than or equal to 0 is going to help us solve this equation, or solve this question, which is to find the domain. If we solve that, we get x is greater than or equal to 5. So that's the domain. So we would say x is greater than or equal to 5 are the possible values that you can plug in here. Because if we plug in anything less than 5, like 4 or 3 or 2, we would get a negative under the square root. Here, the function 3 divided by x minus 7, we cannot have a 0 denominator. So x minus 7 cannot equal 0. So if we solve that, that tells us what values x cannot equal. So we would say all reals except x cannot equal 7. Or you could actually write that out. All reals except 7. Lots of ways to write it, but that's the domain. Domain is possible x values. To find the range, we can think of numbers 5 or greater. If you plug in a 5, you get a 0. If we plug in a 6, square root of 1, we get a 1. So plug in a 2, 3, 4, or I'm sorry, plug in a 7, 8, 9, 10, we're all going to get values from 0 and up. So our range is going to be values greater than or equal to 0. And that's our domain. Another way to find the range is to look at the graph. The graph is like that. So our y values start at 0 and they go up forever. So y is greater than or equal to 0. Think of values you can plug in here. You can plug in anything except 7. So we can plug in 2, 3, 4, 8, 16, anything we want. The graph of that is something like this, and we'll talk more about why it looks like that. Sorry, it doesn't look like that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's my asymptote. So it looks something like this. All values are represented for x, except we can't have any x values equal to 7. So think about what that means for the range. The y values go up forever here, but these y values get close to that 0 and then go down forever. So the y values for the, this is the domain, for the range, the y values, we can say all reals except 0 because this graph goes up forever and down never hits 0. All reals except 0, or you can say all reals and then y does not equal 0. Or we can use interval notation, which we'll talk about a little bit. If we were talking about all reals for interval notation, all reals would be negative infinity to infinity. 
But if we want all real to zero, and then zero to infinity. So everything less than zero, everything greater than zero, but not actually equal to zero. If we have g of x equals negative 3 cosine x over 2, and we need to find the domain and to think about the graph of cosine, or the function cosine. If you take any x value, can you always divide it by 2? Sure, no problem. Once you've divided it by 2, can you take the cosine of any x value? Well, think about the graph of cosine. Are there any x values you can't find the cosine of? Are there any x values that don't have a y value? Well, cosine goes on for right and left, so every x value has a y value. So you can take the cosine of any number you want. So we can plug x in, divide it by 2, take the cosine of it, no matter what x is. And then, of course, we can multiply any number by negative 3. So the domain of negative 3 cosine x over 2 is all reals. Infinity to infinity, you can write this big R. Let's think about the range. So regular cosine of x over 2 would be like this. Similar to that, dividing by 2 changes it a little bit. But then when we multiply the y values by negative 3, that's going to change this high value of 1 to a negative 3 to a positive 3. So that's up here. So the graph changes a little bit as we divide it by 2. This is just the graph of cosine of x. This is the graph of negative 3 cosine x over 2. So that dividing by 2 stretches a little bit right and left, and the negative 3 change in the low values. So our range is going to be from negative 3 to 3, including 3 and negative 3, because our graph does actually touch negative 3 and 3. In interval notation, since we're including the endpoints, we would write negative 3, comma 3 with brackets, because those endpoints are included. In the previous screen, when we did not include the zero, we used parentheses. h of x equals negative 3 cosine x over 5 plus 2. Again, finding the domain x values, we can plug anything in, divide it by 5. We can take the cosine of anything. We can take anything times negative 3, and we can add 2 to anything. So the domain is going to be all real. The range, the dividing by 5 squishes the graph sorry, stretches the graph. Multiplying it by negative 3 makes it look like this, so it goes up to positive 3 and down to negative 3. Adding 2 takes these values, the negative 3 and the positive 3 from this previous graph, and adds 2. So negative 3 plus 2, and being negative 1, and positive 3 plus 2 ends up being 5. And you can see that the low value is negative 1, and if we had this whole graph, the high value would be at 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So the low and the high value, negative 1 to 5. That's what the range is, the lowest and the highest, and everything in between. There are about eight different types of functions. The identity function is just the graph of a straight line, y equals x. That's your identity function. And there's also every other linear function, y equals anything times x, like 3x, or whatever. So those are all those straight lines. And think of vertical lines are not functions, but um, any line that's diagonal at all, and even a horizontal line, those are linear functions. Those are the basic. Then we have absolute value function. And that one is the V-shape line. So absolute value function, again, absolute value could um, be a V down. It could be moved over. Oops. It could be like that. It could be upside down. It could be moved up. But it's a V. All right. So that's absolute value function. A squaring function, anything with so, like a basic parabola. Cubing function, anything with x cubed in it as the highest power. So, anything like that. Could be flipped around, could be moved up or down, but that's the basic shape.
We're going to talk later about how to flip them around and move them up and down. Then we have the square root of x. We could put numbers outside of the square root, inside of the square root, and that moves the graph up and down and around in different shapes. Rational function, anything with some number over x, or anything with x in the denominator. It could be x plus 7 or f 5 times anything with an x in the denominator makes a rational function. And different values will move it around and change where it is, how steep it is, etc. Then we have the sine function, which is like the roller coaster, and it hits the origin 0, 0. That's the basic sine function. Basic cosine function, that's again the roller, and your roller coaster. So those are the two trig functions that are the basic trig functions you need to know. Transformations are the ways that you move graphs around. So take our basic eight functions and move them around. If you want to move them right or left, horizontal shift, you're going to subtract c or add c inside of the function. So if it's in 2, minus c changes it to the right. I know that seems counterintuitive. Minus usually means left. But if it's inside the function, moving it to the right, minus c moves it to the right. And plus c moves the function to the left. So if I have a function like f of x equals the square root of x plus 2, it takes the basic function and moves it to the left, too. The vertical shift is adding c or subtracting c at the end of the function or outside of the function. It doesn't have to be at the end. It could be y equals 2 plus the square root of x. So the square root of x, basic square root of x function, plus 2 outside of the function moves it up two units, two units if we subtract. Reflection about the x-axis, if you put a negative outside of the function. So whatever function we had, if we had the square root of function going like this, if we want the negative square root function, this is the positive square root function, it just reflects it over the x-axis. So it's going to go like that. So this is our x-axis about the y-axis. If you put a negative inside the function, so if we have a negative inside of the function, remember you can't have negatives inside of the function, so these x values would themselves be negative because a negative of a negative would give you a positive. So our x values are only negative, and you can see it's the basic square root of x function flipped over the y-axis. It's reflected over the y-axis, so that's why it ends up there. Reflecting about the origin takes our basic function and reflects it 180 degrees. So it's going to be flipped down and over the x-axis. So take our original function and flip it down over here. Putting a negative inside of the function and outside of the function at the same time. Those are the basic transformations. Composite functions, there are a couple ways to write composite functions. f of g of x or f of g of x like this. A composite function, we take the, the second one and put it inside of the outside one. So in this case, if we want f of g of x, we're going to take this cosine and plug it in here for the value of x. So that becomes negative 2. I'm sorry. I did that already. It becomes cosine of, and then in place of x, we're going to write negative 2x minus 3. We're going to have to do this in the next slide.